Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and thank you for joining me today on CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. This week's episode is incredibly special for me. I'm excited because I get the opportunity to introduce you to three gifted servants of Christ who come from my years serving at Timwick Hospital in Eastern Kenya as a missionary surgeon and medical director. While I was in Africa earlier this summer, in the month of June, I took the opportunity to sit down with these three dedicated heart surgeons, one an American, another a Kenyan, and the third an Ethiopian. Each of these doctors, well, they're playing a key role in the growth and development of the busiest heart surgery program in the nation of Kenya, a heart program that is caring for patients well beyond the borders of that nation in East Africa. The American, a missionary, is Dr. Russ White. He's a missionary general and thoracic surgeon who was my partner at Tenwick for nearly 20 years. Russ is leading a rapidly growing cardiothoracic surgery program at Tenwick Hospital that includes a cardiac surgery training program under the auspices of the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, or PAX for short, as it's known. I asked Russ to join me over coffee during my time at Tenwick in June. Our conversation captured an up-to-date perspective on how God is doing a work that is exceeding abundantly above all that anyone, including Russ, could have asked or imagined using those inspired words from the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. A work that is impacting the management of heart disease for an entire region of Sub-Saharan Africa. Along the way, God has led some highly gifted African physicians to join Dr. White in these efforts, and you will hear from them after my conversation with Russ. So let's listen in together. Today, in a very unique position, uh, for the first time out in the field, doing an interview for CMDA Matters, and I'm with an old friend and a co-worker of 20 years, Dr. Russ White, who's a general surgeon, thoracic surgeon, has become a cardiovascular surgeon, and we're actually doing this interview in Russ's house um, here in Southwest Kenya at Tenwick Hospital. Russ did his undergraduate training at Roberts Wesleyan, and then went on for, to do medical school at the University of Michigan. And uh, then general surgical residency at uh, Brown University in Providence. And then on the way, I think, Russ, you got a MPH, I think, was that Har- Harvard? That's correct. Uh, MPH from Harvard. And during that time, I uh, got to experience, I think, Tenwick Hospital for the first time as, mm-hmm. a, as a resident for a few months. And then um, uh, went on and did some extra training. After being at Tenwick, he saw how much esophageal cancer there was. Uh, among the Kipsigis population and did an extra year of uh, thoracic surgery. Did you get to do much cardiac surgery during that fellowship there in England? I got to do a little, but I uh, I avoided it like the plague. Didn't think there was going to be much use for that Didn't in the future? Didn't think I would use it at all. Well, that was a... That was a false prophecy, wasn't it? (laughs) So Russ and his wife, Beth, have five kids, four boys, and then a girl, Anna, who's their final child, if you will, here in Kenya, getting ready to graduate from high school from Rift Valley Academy. So welcome to CMDA Matters. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be with you here in my my own basement. (laughs) Well, back in uh, 97, I can remember um, a really special day running down from the hospital. I think it was maybe September, October of 97. And uh, you and Beth pulled up with at least two boys at that time, and I was delighted to add another long-term surgeon here at Tenwick since it was me and a few short-term visitors. Yeah, I remember that very well as well, Mike. And uh, I remember how, uh, you know, maybe both you and I had some disappointment in that uh, I was planning to be the, the, the fourth surgeon to be in a group. That was going to be Bob Weshey and Michael Johnson and, uh-huh. and you and me. And suddenly in a very short period of time that changed to to two it was you and me and uh, i think we both felt a little overwhelmed and felt like we were going to spend quite a bit of time in books doing things we had never done before 
Well, I think I don't remember when it took place, but it, at some point in time, although we both did a little bit of everything, I think uh, we, we had this verbal agreement that you were going to cover urology and I was going to cover orthopedics along the way. <laughs> Although you covered a whole lot more than urology, I think. Yeah, we we did come to that. You got the clean, the relatively clean specialty. No and, stirrups. Yeah, no stirrups and no urine. So you, somehow you got I, the I better the, part. I, I won the coin flip, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, in those early, early months, uh, you really had a passion for treating esophageal cancer. And uh, clearly that practice just grew and grew and grew. Just tell our listeners just a little bit about why you just jumped into esophageal cancer early on and did that fellowship uh, in the UK. I came to Tenwick first time, as you, as you alluded to, uh, during my residency. I took two years out of my residency and did a year of public health training at Harvard. And then I spent about seven months here at Tenwick, and we viewed that, my wife and I, as a time for God to speak to us, to confirm this calling that we felt in our hearts for long-term missions, and to perhaps open our eyes to where he would have us go. Well, it was really the, quite honestly, the first day we were here during that time as a third-year resident that I just felt like God was saying, this is the place. Mm -hmm. It's not just a place to learn, but it's the actual place. I didn't know what my wife would think, though. Uh, at that time, we had one child, and she was a little nervous about raising a child in Africa. And I went home to her at the end of the day and said, I think this could be the place. What do you think? And she said, I've been praying and thinking all day today, and I think this is where God wants us to be. Wow. And that was a tremendous blessing, to have a, a focus and a place to look toward. But while I was here, I saw so much esophageal cancer. And as you know, at that time, virtually nothing was being done for those patients. Right. Other than a feeding tube placed surgically, they would all die unable to swallow. And I thought, we could do more. There's got to be a way we could do more. So I had an interest, and I just saw such a need. So I went off and did this training in, in England, where we focused a lot on esophageal work. Uh, I had a little time in cardiac, but as I said, I, I avoided it as much as I could just enough to pass the rotational requirements. And looking back, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll get into this as we talk, but cardiac is now one of the big things we do. I'm grateful that God uses the, the foolish things of this world, because surely if I had to make that decision again over, I would do it differently. But God uses even the foolish to bring about His will. I, I think I was even in the U.S. on furlough when I heard that you were going to be tackling some pretty big cardiovascular cases. And I think one of the early cases was even on our own head chaplain here, yeah. uh, an arch, aortic arch aneurysm in the early days. In fact, I just saw him during my, my week, uh, week visit here this week and put my ear up to his chest and listened to his valve clicking mm -hmm. away inside. But at what point in time did you think that was possible, that it might just be possible to do open heart surgery here at Timok Hospital. You know, you you will remember Dr. Dick Morris very well. Dick was a pediatrician at Tenwick for many, many years. And Dick used to come to me knowing that I had had some cardiothoracic training in my background, trying to convince me to do heart surgery. And I argued with Dick and said, number one, it's not practical. We're out in the middle of rural Kenya. It's just not going to happen. You don't understand the amount of equipment, the amount of resources, the amount of training involved to make that happen. And number two, I don't think there's that many patients that need help. I really don't. I don't see them. Well, he saw them. I didn't. So it was in 2008 that I started to see more and more of the dick kept sending patients to, to see me and i kept seeing more and more of these kids with rheumatic heart disease and i finally realized this massive number of kids that are out there waiting with with nothing nobody to help them it's no option and uh, i talked to a friend of mine a cardiac surgeon in rhode island and said what do you think why don't you come over here and let's see what we can do and he came over and we did the old-fashioned operation, this is a 1952 operation that requires a tubs dilator. That's something a, you get out of a museum or something. Exactly, <laughs> something you would get out of a museum. Uh, and when I talked to him, he said, you know, we're going to need a tubs dilator. And I smiled because when I graduated from fellowship in England, we had a going-away dinner, and they gave me a little gift. 
and that gift was a tubs dilator <laughs> for a museum piece to put on your shelf. And that's where it was, sitting on my shelf gathering dust. And I literally took it off the bookshelf and washed it off and put it through the sterilizer. And that's what we first used. And we did about a dozen of these kids. But you can only do that operation for a select few mm -hmm. that really need it. The, the others will need full open heart surgery. My friend and I started talking. I said, I don't know how we can do this, but I think we should. And I had been avoiding it very much, saying, as I told you, I don't, I don't think we can do this here. And it was as if the Lord was knocking on my door, my heart, and finally I said, all right, let's try. And uh, multiple friends brought over the equipment, and we started doing this, and kids came out of the woodwork needing help. So that to this day, we have about 400 kids on a waiting list, waiting for open how, heart how surgery. How many have you done today? We've done about 1,000 total. 1,000? Cases, total cases. Yeah. Since yeah. what year was that? That first year was 2008, and those, those first three to four years were very few cases that we would do with teams. And then if you look at the graph, the graph starts going up, so that now we're doing about 200 cases per year. Wow. And you were telling me, I think, just this week, that there's no other center, certainly in Kenya or in East Africa, that's anywhere close to this volume. Is that right? That's right. Tenwick is the, the largest provider, single provider of open heart surgery in Kenya and therefore all the surrounding countries as well, since Kenya is the most advanced medically and socioeconomically. Now, you have teams that come from how many different places? I know Vanderbilt is one of those. I believe they keep coming, or are they not still coming to help you? No, they are still coming. We have teams from Vanderbilt, from Boston Children's Hospital, from Maine Medical Center, from Ocala Heart Institute in Florida, and then we have quite a few that come from the Mayo Clinic as well. So it's, it's well represented. We, we transitioned uh, about seven years ago to a point where we were totally dependent on outside teams to where now we're independent. We operate every week, come rain or snow, <laughs> we do the cases. We still have teams coming primarily for the congenital heart disease. And we are doing congenital heart cases, but we're doing the much more simple type cases and we wait for teams to come to do the complex cases. And as I poke my head in the room, room two this week, it's a it's a very national team when you look across it. Other than, uh, you mentioned the state of Maine, you have a perfusionist missionary who's here training others uh, to run the perfusion machine. Tell us a little bit about uh, Bob Groom and what he's doing. Yeah, Bob's been a great blessing to us. Uh, we trained these perfusionists um, with the visiting teams over the years. And it's been honestly very hard to keep them on staff. Mm -hmm. And you know why that is. You know that uh, once people are trained and have a skill set that is valuable, they'll often go somewhere else. And we've experienced that. Bob came about a dozen times uh, with his team from the Maine Medical Center. Mm -hmm. And as he kept coming, I finally said, Bob, what do you think about an early retirement? He said, are you planning to retire? I said, no, I was referring to you, Bob. <laughs> Why don't you take an early retirement and come and join us? And he did it. And uh, so he's now joined us, and he is teaching and training our national staff in perfusion. And it's the only fully accredited program now in the country, uh, training perfusionists. Well, I had lunch with Bob and his wife, Holly, yesterday. And I told Bob that I think he's a very wonderful example of of an emphasis kind of a program that we're pushing at CMDA, which is a capstone program, which is someone's had a career in which they've made, you know, uh, a lot of success and really feel called by God um, to have a different, I wouldn't say now you're going to have significance, but, but a different kind of significance after great success. And so I, I think for those of you listening out there in our audience, um, uh, Bob is making an incredible difference. I guess he's traveled up to Egypt and uh, to one of the busiest heart institutions uh, on the continent. Yeah, he's been uh, up to Egypt, the Magdi Yaqub Heart Center, and people who are in cardiac surgery will recognize that name. Magdi Yaqub, or Sir Magdi Yaqub, still works there. He's 87. He's still scrubbing cases and um, they needed help with their perfusion program. So Bob has done this, 
And I, I view this as just one example of many where we are getting involved with local establishments, with hospitals, with university programs, and cooperating, showing, that, uh, showing the love of Christ through cooperation in medical care. Well, as I said, I put my head in, all national team, including um, only your white head showing <laughs> at, at the table. A lot of African uh, faces and uh, folks working at the table doing very complicated open heart surgery. So let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about the training program that under the auspices of PAX, after having started general surgery training now for a number of years under PAX, uh, just how many years ago you got approval to start a cardiac surgery training fellowship? Yeah, the cardiac program with PAX started in 2018 officially. And we began with one of our graduates, uh, Dr. Arega Leta, and uh, he had done his full general surgical training with us and then gone down to Malawi and helped them start a general surgical program. Mm -hmm. So he was there for four years as a general surgeon, but really his heart, uh, his dream was to do cardiothoracic surgery. So he was our first fellow and as you know, he's now my partner. Uh, and as of January, we added another partner, Dr. Agneta Odera, that you know well, also. For the first two grads of the general surgery training program. Exactly. They were the, the two first graduates. And uh, it's certainly not to say that all of them need to go into cardiac. I'm not, I'm not trying to imply that. But uh, this was their dream and their hope. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you, it, the, the last year when I added a partner, it was like manna from heaven. Uh, <laughs> Finally, I wasn't on call every night and every weekend. And uh, Arega and Agneta have been a blessing to me beyond so you, words. So there are three of you now, and then how many fellows? Uh, there are three fellows. Talk to our listeners about the future and uh, what's coming here at Timic in the next two years. Well, once again, I, I feel like uh, really it was the Lord speaking to me. You know, I, I, I've not gotten any telegrams from the Lord, but... Um, in my heart, there was a part of me thinking, I'm getting kind of old, and maybe I should start thinking about wrapping things up here at Tenwick. But the other side of my head was saying, no, there's so much work yet to be done. And look how far we've come with cardiothoracic, and look how far we could go. Mm -hmm. As you know, we're limited right now to a single operating room and a very tight recovery stroke ICU. And that's our biggest reason we can't get more patients in. So this idea came, why don't we expand? Why don't we build a dedicated cardiothoracic unit? Mm -hmm. There's nothing like it in the sub-Saharan region of Africa. Why don't we be the first ones to do that and do it in the name of the Lord? So this idea started to germinate and started to grow. We found some land available and uh, we started to work with an architectural group out of the U.S to come up with some plans. I do have to say those plans grew as we, uh, as we built them. And when I go up there now and walk through the, the current construction site, I'm just in awe of how big this place is. But this place will, will allow us to uh, truly expand and take care of the patients waiting. It's, it will have six operating rooms, two cardiac cath labs, 36 ICU beds, wow. 170 total beds and in a complete endoscopy unit. So it'll be truly cardiothoracic. Well, you're a poster professional for God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could have ever asked or thought. You did plenty of preparation, but it went. what, what has happened here at Tenwick, of course, with an incredible team and others. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've talked to Dr. Agnet, I've talked to Dr. Rega uh, in the past and even this week and their commitment to me and the sacrifices that they have made along the way themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, including relationships and family have just been outstanding. Um, and so it's pretty amazing. I, over the years, many times, even this week, as I've seen, greeted uh, some patients in Kipsigis here at Timmerk Hospital, reminded them that it's just amazing. God loves the people of Southwest Kenya so much because mm. this incredible place in the middle of nowhere, it seems, yeah. has sprung up. But faithfulness by Dr. Sturry and Dr. Morse and others. So thanks for being faithful here at Tenwick. Uh, Russ, you and Beth, and I am going to pray for you rest and restoration this coming year. Uh, so God bless you, and thank you for joining us today on CMDA Matters. Mike, it's been a pleasure for me to be with you. Thanks very much.
you briefly heard Dr. White and I discussing the PACS program, referring to two graduates of the surgical residency there at Tenwick, Dr. Agneta Odera and Dr. Arega Leta. As I said earlier, PACS stands for the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. The program got its start in the mid-90s by a group of missionary surgeons in West Africa as a strategic response to the ever-growing need for surgeons in all of Africa. Formerly, it was a ministry of CMDA, and then it became its own 501c3 program in 2020 with training in general surgery, orthopedic surgery, pediatric surgery, OBGYN, neurosurgery, and cardiac surgery fellowship programs in nine countries, 21 distinct training programs throughout Africa. Through these various training programs, 123 residents are currently in training to become surgeons who care for the poor and the sick. PAX also disciples these surgeons to share the love of Christ with their patients to bring hope to those who are suffering. Dr. Agneta and Dr. Arega are two graduates of those programs, and it was a joy and a privilege to see how they have grown in their skills, and they're now training others. I ask each of them to join me and talk about how the Lord led them to be trained at Tenwick and how they have been trained to bring the hope and healing of Christ to the world. First, let's jump in to my conversation with Dr. Agneta Odera. Well, today on CMDA Matters, I have an amazing and exciting opportunity to talk with an old friend, a Kenyan physician that I have watched grow up uh, from just a medical school graduate to being a consultant cardiovascular surgeon. Dr. Agneta Odera um, here at Timwick Hospital uh, is on faculty in the cardiac surgery department. Welcome to the program today, Dr. Odera. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Now, Agneta, you grew up not very far at all from Timmock Hospital, is that right? Yes, I did, about an hour's drive from here. Did you know anything about Timmock Hospital growing up, much at all? I knew there were two mission hospitals away from Kericho. Um, I'd heard of Kaplong Mission Hospital, and actually my sister was born there. But I'd never heard of Tenwick until after I went to medical school and uh, I was thinking of a site to do internship. I think during that time, Tenwick Hospital is affiliated with the Christian Hospital Association of Kenya, and they usually come to do interviews to scout for interns for the subsequent internship year. And that's when I met uh, Dr. Chuck Bem, who was a pediatrician then working at Tenwick. I liked the pitch they gave about Tenwick. I was surprised I had never heard about it. Uh Uh, But I felt a very strong calling then that that was where I wanted to do my internship. And that was the only place I wanted to do my internship. So. And during your internship, Agneta, it was clear you loved children. It was clear you, not only did you take care of children in the hospital, but you led the children in worship in our local church. And uh, you, you were like a, a magnet to, uh, <laughs> to uh, Watoto, as they say in Swahili. Yes, I've always felt uh, really drawn to children. Just their innocence and their obvious love for life, um, their unconditional way in which they interact and love people. And just during my internship, I felt a strong calling to really serve the needs for children in the healthcare. So you were thinking for a while, maybe pediatrics and neonatal intensive care, but then surgery came calling. And there was this opportunity maybe either to train in, in Nairobi, but then this thing called PACS came up and you were a pioneer who took some risks, I believe, <laughs> didn't you? Yes, I think of myself as a guinea pig. I, I call myself a guinea pig for Jesus. Um, that was a very, one of the defining moments in my life, I can say spiritual wise and career wise. At that time, Kenya had just witnessed one of the most horrific post-election violence. And I had been struggling with where I wanted to do my training and advancing my career. I had a strong inclination towards pediatric oriented specialties. And yet the need I saw for surgical needs, especially for children, um, having worked with a lot of kids who had burns, congenital uh, heart defects, congenital other malformations. And a lot of them, the parents would just take them home and let them die because going to Nairobi, the capital for specialty care was very expensive. It was a different culture. It was a different experience for them. So 
I had actually applied to Nairobi and even to the UK and the US and I was looking for options because I felt that I wanted to do this and I wanted to do it well. Mm -hmm. And I felt strongly that God was leading me towards that. Um, Yet looking back and seeing the need here, it was very obvious where God was drawing me and I struggled with that for a while. I wrestled with it. And I remember at one point I told God, I'm tired of all the voices drawing me in different directions. (laughs) I just want to hear your voice Mm. and I want your presence with me in the decisions I make. And it seemed a very obvious choice to go to the US where I was, there was a very promising uh, position at Cincinnati Children's. Mm -hmm. I I would be escaping the post-election violence that was still very real and horrific here. And I remember my parents were very surprised with my decision to stay and uh, join a program, PACS, that was untested. Um, there was not, no not even accredi- recogni- no not recognition. Not recognized in the by the licensing body here. It was not accredited. It seemed like a very foolish choice to, <laughs> to be open about that. But um, sometimes God uses the things that we deem foolish or weak or unwise to prove Himself. And I think for me, it was the beginning of a journey uh, that was clearly handpicked by God, and I don't regret that decision. And then, how long, much later, did the recognition finally come from the board here in Kenya? I remember the letter came just a few months shy of my graduation, five years later. <laughs> um, and I and remember, it was retroactive, I, I, I guess. Yes, yes, the recognition was retroactive. But God's timing is perfect. For five years, I worked and toiled as a surgical resident, not knowing my future, but just at the right time, God allowed it to happen. Yeah. And then there was another period of faith. You you tried for you were working very hard with lots of help from consultants and recommendations to go on to do pediatric surgery training in South Africa, right? Yes. Yes. Again, I was again looking for a good place to train and advance myself. And I applied at many different sites, but it seemed from one moment to another doors just kept getting shut. And I, I still remember vividly one time when I shared at our local church here that I felt a strong calling that this is where God was leading me. But as six months turned to one year and then to two years, mm-hmm. I began to wonder if God had really forgotten, if it was a dream that I myself had conjured up and really it wasn't God's voice. One thing I learned during that period, it's not really the destination to where you're getting to that matters. It's your attitude during the period of waiting Mm. that matters. And um, I learned a lot about what it was to trust in God. He honestly shut the doors that did not need to be opened. And the place where he called me, I couldn't have selected a better place. So all along when you were in South Africa and finished there, were you thinking pediatric heart surgery all along or did that come later? So I've always had a fascination with hearts and... uh, anything related to operating on the heart. It's been my passion, but um, looking at the opportunities for training in that, it seemed very dire, and I didn't think it was possible. I didn't see it possible. I just, at the beginning, wanted to do anything surgical related to children and just better myself so that I'd be as capable as possible to be able to take care of them in rural Africa. And so when the opportunity came to train in cardiothoracic, I just saw that God again was opening the door. What year did that start, Agneta? So the cardiothoracic training was officially started at Tenwick in 2018. I completed my pediatric surgery uh, specialty training at the end of 2018, and then I joined in 2019. How have you seen quality of care uh, over the years here at Tenwick? I, it's it's amazing to see the growth, um, and just not only with the residents, but in all kind of stuff. I think as specialty care need grew and that need was addressed, um, I think it ushered, needed, ushered in an era where we've been blessed to have so many visiting specialties uh, through SPU and uh, World Gospel Mission and other uh, mission-affiliated agencies that have come and poured their time and their expertise, and to see that translated into really superb care I dare say, almost similar to a first world setting, yeah. is amazing. It's well, I wonder, listeners, to know that uh, Dr. Odera has been an inspiration to many younger women in medicine and surgery. I'm quite sure that I will never be in a, uh, the feature of an article in Forbes magazine, but you have, and I think the title of that article was The Future 
of uh, uh, African Medicine is Female or something like that, isn't it? That was the title. Uh, a great article in Forbes magazine. Um, and I know that a number of younger uh, women, the surgery program here has, had, has, has taken, accepted a number of women who've passed through and are now practicing here in Kenya and maybe beyond. Have you been mentoring a number of uh, younger women in surgery and medicine over these past few years? Uh, yes, I have. Um, I think if there's anything great that anyone sees in me, it's because someone believed in me and someone took time to nurture me and mentor me and train me. And I just want to pass that favor to someone else. I'm very passionate about mentorship. I think, I think one of the great successes of any training institution is to have a great mentor. Mm-hmm. And I still have a mentor to date, and I hope until the day I die, I will have a mentor. <laughs> I actually am very much involved in a women mentorship group um, affiliated with the College of Surgeons of East, Central, and Af- Southern Africa. is a Women in Surgery Africa group. And uh, our goal is just to um, encourage female surgeons um, in their career and to celebrate them and their God-given abilities. I think there's been, there's, there's been a lot of challenges with female surgeons in a very difficult specialty, and especially cardiothoracic is very challenging, as well as other special subspecialties. But one of the key things I want females to remember as they try and juggle their career and motherhood and other God-given responsibilities is that there is a reason they were created female, and they shouldn't let those other abilities diminish. Mm. They should be celebrated, they should be embraced, and they should be allowed to thrive um, wholly. Um, so I'm very passionate about mentoring women, and, and I hope it will be a, mo- a movement that will continue to grow. And as lo- alongside celebrating men, because there are very many great men who have embraced and encouraged women to take mm. up this career. Yeah. As we finish up this interview, could you share with our listeners maybe a, a scripture or a passage that has either been a theme for you during your career, or where something God is doing a new work in you these days? I think what I would share is that I know we all have dreams. Everyone, when they're born, they have a dream and a desire of something they feel strongly that God has called them to achieve. And sometimes the dream is realized quickly. Sometimes it takes a while to get to the destination. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes the light is dim. But something that has been an encouragement to me is a prayer by Francis Drake. And I think I will will leave that. It says, the prayer says, disturb us, Lord when we are too pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we have arrived safely because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity and in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dream. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly to venture on wider seas, where storms will show your mastery, where in losing sight of land we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. Wow. Thank you, Agneta, for joining me today on CMDA Matters, and I trust that your testimony will be an inspiration and will give somebody an infusion that this little conversation we've had for a few minutes will be a small hinge that opens a great big door to challenge others to be obedient to God. Thank you for taking your time out today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. God bless you all. Well, I hope it was not only an inspiration to you, but I also pray it was a holy disturbance after she read that prayer at the end of her testimony. Well, next, but certainly not least, is my conversation with Dr. Arega. So let's listen in on my conversation there in Kenya with Dr. Arega Leta. (laughs) 
Well, today on CMDA Matters, I have a wonderful opportunity to talk to an old friend of mine whom I met uh, over 12 years ago here at Tenwick Hospital. In early 2010, I came with a team for two weeks. I was a, a rare opportunity for me to serve short term at Tenwick. And I found uh, someone that I've come to know as the Ethiopian Prince. And uh, his name is Dr. Arega Leta Fakadu. It took me a while to learn that name, Dr. Arega, but welcome to CMDA Matters. Thank you so much for having me. So would you briefly tell our listeners just a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and uh, how you came to be at Temuk Hospital? I was born and raised in Ethiopia in a very rural community, and uh, and I grew up and went to school and finished and I did my uh, medical school in one of the oldest uh, universities in the country, that was uh, Jimma University. And then uh, after that, I went to a mission hospital in the western part of Ethiopia. Because of my desire to do general surgery training, I was uh, introduced to the Pax program through uh, Lomalinda University president, who uh, by that time was working with Pax as well as an umbrella organization and uh, so he asked me because of my desire to do general surgery training he told me if I can apply to website of Pax and uh, sent me the co a link and I did that and then uh, Pax interviewed me I submitted my old uh, documents credentials and uh, I was uh, assigned to start my Pax residency program in 2007 in Cameroon Banso Baptist Hospital so um, without um, any delay I, I went there did my first year training and uh, because of the COSEXA requirement College of East Central and uh, Southern Africa requirement as part of it being six months orthopedic uh, rotation I moved to Ethiopia Sordo Christian Hospital where I did that second year and then because Sodo Christian Hospital at that time was not accredited by Ethiopian government and also COSEXA program, I looked for a accredited center to continue my FCS um, level in the training in uh, general surgery. Tenwick was that time uh, fully accredited. So I applied to move to Tenwick. So I joined Tenwick Mission Hospital in 2009 to continue my third year and the rest of my residency program to fifth year. I'm grateful I got an acceptance to move over to Tenwick and uh, I did uh, an amazing journey in general surgery training in, in Tenwick. Uh, right here at Tenwick. Uh, right here. At, at well, I had forgotten that you were way over on in West Africa. So yeah. you've actually had sort of a progressive residency, didn't you? <laughs> exactly. Cameroon and then Ethiopia. And then you came to Tenwick Hospital where I met you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you joined Dr. Agneta Odera as yes. the very first class. Yep. You graduated from general surgery in 2012. 2012, first yeah. graduate. Yes. And uh, I think you you had some commitments that you had to fulfill, didn't you? Yes. I, in fact, I was um, uh, I was asked if I'm willing to go back and serve a mission hospital in west part of Ethiopia by by uh, Loma Linda University uh, president who introduced me to Pax after finishing, and um, I I said yes. So when I graduated, it is it was a straightforward. I've committed myself to go and serve because that uh, w portion of the country, over over four million people had no no surgeon, uh, no surgeon that oh, time. Yeah. So I I decided to move back there and where I worked um, as a general surgeon in a mission hospital, um, and then later on I moved to. Uh, South East African country, that is Malawi, Malawi yeah. uh, to start general surgery, a PAX training program um, to open a new program. You were the director or assistant program director? I was assistant program director oh. because I had a colleague who was five years already senior to me and working at the hospital. But as PAX criteria, you need two qualified surgeons to start a program. Sure. So I joined him and we started together. And for how many years were you there in Malawi? I worked for four years. Okay. So commitment of five years, one year in Ethiopia, four years in Malawi, five years. I completed the five-year commitment before I start to uh, venture in the next journey of my life. So when I think of Dr. Arega, 
I think of a man who keeps his word. And that takes me now to a story that I really want our listeners to hear. Because I, I, I'd come back to Timwick in 2010, got to know a uh, short term, and then I came back later in the year to stay again, a return. And I really didn't know your story, Arega. But we were out on a retreat with all the residents I and uh, out in the Masai Mara. And, you know, I, over the years, I came to <laughs> not very much enjoy the morning game drives because they were so cold. The vehicles were open. And frankly, I never saw any lion kill as, uh, any kind of animals. And so I thought it was a big waste of time. I stayed behind thinking I was alone. But in the lodge, I went out onto the, uh, uh, on the ver- veranda. And there was Dr. Arega sitting, enjoying a cup of coffee or tea. And you told me a story that I've never forgotten. Would you tell our listeners about what happened when Soto, it looked like Soto wasn't going to work and you wondered what was next and Timwek had accepted you, but then there came a distraction, maybe a temptation. Yes. Uh, in fact, when I was finishing my residency and, uh, well, uh, you know, anybody like as an African who come out of uh, a poor family background, want to uh, uh, earn a better salary and want to support his or her siblings. Um, so that was the time when I was finishing and I was asked if I can, uh, two places, one, even at 10 week, if I can remain in faculty here. Um, and then the second one was, uh, I was offered job a- a- elsewhere where, where really there's a high pay. And then I, I sat down and I, I, I talked to myself. And in fact, Dr. Chap, you, you conversed with me and he said, how do you see your future and where are you going to work? And then my answer was very short and clear and said, I have a commitment, I'm going to go back. And uh, that was uh, then what you, you mentioned about um, uh, how about if the other opportunities and offers come into um, your way, how will you handle that? And then I just said, um, yeah, because this is my personal conversation with myself and with God. And that was um, even the commitment I committed myself to go and serve a mission, rural mission hospital was I did not sign any document. I did not. I was uh. only told. And even that time, the PAX program never moved to five years. It started as four-year program. Mm-hmm. Later, it evolved to uh, em- em- uh, embrace the American uh, curriculum, which is a five-year program, which was added later. But I, I, but I have no document signed to, to say, but I said it. You I said, it. said yeah, it. Not a written signature, yes. but your word. I committed. I said it. I will serve one year for each year of training. Mm -hmm. And I know God heard it, and my mind knows knows it. There's nothing around uh, to be be dealt with. If I remember correctly, Rega, there was also someone who wrote you from the U.S. Tell our listeners about uh, that invitation. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a very close friend to uh, mine. Uh, He lives in, in Maryland. He is a pharmacist by, by profession. He trained in Cape Town and he moved to U.S. and we grew together. And he said, I have a place in where you can easily come and, and you can, I could send you invitation. Would you come and do with your, your skills and with your knowledge, you will fit into this system very easily. And I'm here to help you and I have many connections about it. And then I, I told him, I said, well, I have a commitment and there's a reason why God brought me, made me born here and brought me into this system. And uh, I said, well, how will I explain mm. to anybody today, United States does not need me as much as Africa needs me. Mm-hmm. And then I said, I also have a commitment. And I just say, he told me, if you come and earn money and you can help with that money, your people in your country, with it, I just said, well, money will not physically treat and minister to people. Yes, money is very important. But if somebody like me, a Christian and, and educated to my level, fails to keep his or her commitment 
who else under the sun would do it? And those are the words I remember from that <laughs> conversation. Who else? If not me, then yeah. who? Because I know my heart. I know myself. I am a rega and I am responsible, accountable to God. You told me earlier this week, it seems that the opportunities, they're always... May, whether they are coming from the enemy or just coming randomly, there are always opportunities to do something else yeah. that's much more lucrative. You told me that even uh, there was a university in the U.S. Uh, which you have been given uh, faculty status had asked yeah. you to come and help them. And yeah. again, another decision point for, exactly. for a rega. <laughs> that's very true. And I said, would you uh, wish to continue with us and stay here? And then I just said, well... Thank you for the offer, but I have a commitment. And then they just pull back and anytime you want, the door is open for you, but we honor your commitment. I just say thank you for honoring that for me. Yeah. I said this is this is a true to me in my heart and I always keep this one. And uh, there's a reason God brought me here and uh, called me to this service. And uh, I believe giving back to God what he has given to us is, is I think, the, the most joyful thing to do. And uh, I think that is a sense of life to me. Um, personally, that's how I understand. How do you see the program, the training program, uh, continuing to grow, with, especially with new facilities coming? It is basically, simply you can say, it is, it is the best ever. Because um, the, the reason why I'm saying is it is we have many, at least the minimum 20 faculties on board. These 20 faculties here, full time faculty, we have three, four right now. But we have highly committed Christian cardiothoracic surgery professors from the United States who give every week lecture in the morning for one and a half hour, mm. and who uh, come also intermittently, uh, basically like about six months of the year is fully covered by the visiting professors. So this combination of the, the uh, African-based training with Western-based expertise may, uh, all coming together, to train and mentor here. Already centers in Nairobi are currently saying, we don't want to send ourselves, our fellows to India for experience. Would you allow us to send for a week? Can we sign memorandum of understanding? Mm -hmm. All those things, yeah. they are, they're coming out and asking. And um, I tell you, this is, this is a very, very, it is going to lay a very solid foundation for establishment of cardiothoracic surgery service, a true cardiothoracic surgery service in Sub-Saharan Africa at different levels. It seems to me that uh, what is ahead uh, for Tenwick and for you as the first graduate of the program on faculty here, the sky is the limit. Uh, a difference to be made in Africa for heart surgery that hasn't really been made before quite like this. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is, this is a great opportunity to make, you know, I, I believe somewhere, even general surgery, any other discipline, somewhere some committed people started. They committed to teach others. And today, the whole world will get the service. Somebody has to commit and sacrifice to make a difference somewhere. And that is probably, I believe, that's no, no, no uh, string attached. Just committing yourself to make a difference for what God has in, uh, entrusted into you and then and then giving to others, establish a high quality, life changing for eternity and ministering to them. I think that is that is uh, we, we, we all have to look into that. And all of us have various callings and and uh, uh, talents that God has given us. And we we want to utilize for his glory in changing lives eternally that's I, I that's how i look at it and uh, and that's why we we can't we can't stop enjoying what we do and there's always you see different faces you see a smiling face in the morning after surgery 
talking to them and sharing about, about Christ with them. And many, many people come to know Christ through this procedure, oh, and that's I, amazing. I have to tell you that the two disciplines that I've always had a little bit of holy jealousy maybe about <laughs> are the eye surgeons. Yes. It opens yeah. its way to spiritual ministry and true. the heart surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I fix bones and bowels, and I know there are ways to, to do spiritual ministry, but yours opens the door so quickly to that's spiritual great. ministry. Great. Well, the vision of CMDA is bringing the the hope and healing of Jesus Christ to the world. And uh, thank you, Dr. Orega, for joining me today and for being daily a part of bringing hope and healing of Christ, doing that care, heart care in Jesus' name. God bless you and your family. Thank you so much, Dr. Chap. It's so wonderful to join you again after a couple of years of uh, being a part. Thank you for what you are doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. All I can say is I'm just so excited about the ripple effect that the PAX program there at Timok Hospital is having upon the country of Kenya and even throughout East Africa. It's a real life example of how long-term missionaries just like Dr. White are impacting African national physicians, physicians just like Dr. Agneta and Dr. Arega, who then go on to impact their own people and their own profession while bringing the hope and healing of Christ to Africans, all to the glory of God. It's incredible to see the faithfulness of God's people spread in such amazing ways as the PAX program continues to grow and bear more fruit. If you'd like to find out more information about PAX, then be sure to visit paxpaacs.net. You can learn more about their training programs, as well as the hospitals they support, and even volunteer opportunities that they have available for both short-term visitors as well as long-term faculty. And for those of you listening who want to hear more about the growing cardiothoracic surgical program there at Tenwick, then just visit Tenwick Hosp, that's T-E-N-W-E-K-H-O-S-P dot org, or you can find the link in our show notes today. I also want to take this opportunity to give a shout out to our friends at Samaritan's Purse and World Medical Mission for the wonderful logistical support that they gave to me and to my medical education international team of 14 short-term volunteers back in June. The World Medical Mission team provides logistical support for short-term volunteers to mission hospitals all around the globe. And for the time being as a bonus, they're able to assist in covering economy airfares for the doctors who volunteer and serve in these hospitals. You can check them out by going to SamaritansPurse.org. And if you go to that page, you will see pictures of both Dr. Russ White and myself side by side because we are both plenary speakers in Orlando, Florida next month for the Prescription for Renewal Conference. Dates September 15th through the 18th. Our pictures are sandwiched between former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Bible teacher Pastor Skip Heitzig. Well, speaking of opportunities to serve on the mission field, here at CMDA, we want to equip you with the resources you need to live on mission wherever you are and to help you emulate our Savior's special concern for the lost, the poor, and the marginalized. Our Center for Advancing Healthcare Missions, which we call CAM, seeks to mobilize and support healthcare professionals to use their professional skills to help people encounter Jesus Christ, both here in the US as well as around the world. One of the initiatives running through CAM is the Capstone Project that you briefly heard me mention during my interview with Dr. White. Through Capstone, we are encouraging our members to pause step back and consider how they just might want to live, practice, and do ministry in the latter part of their careers. Course corrections in career and lifestyle, well, they don't happen overnight. They require a lot of prayer, discernment, discussion, as well as planning. There's no one size fits all here. That's why we are here to help you prayerfully and courageously consider what life changes God is asking you to make now. Changes that will put you in a position to finish well. 
We all want to break that tape at the finish line of our careers and know in our hearts that we've not withheld anything from Jesus. Anticipating his words, those seven words that I long to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. If you'd like more information about CAM and the Capstone Project, just visit cmda.org slash CAM, C-A-H-M. During my chat with Dr. Agnetta, you heard me mention the article in Forbes magazine that features her and the work she is doing in Kenya. You can actually find that article online at the Forbes website, or we've tried to make it easy for you. You can click on the link in our show notes today. I was so encouraged to hear Dr. Agneta talking about the mentoring community that she has with other female surgeons and physicians there in Kenya. It reminded me of CMDA's Women, Physicians, and Dentists in Christ ministry. This group of women focus on encouraging and supporting Christian women in healthcare as they share the unique challenges of women physicians as well as dentists who desire to glorify God throughout their careers. Their upcoming annual conference is in Newport Beach, California next month. It is from September 15th through the 18th. It's the perfect opportunity for women to find rest, just as it says in Matthew 11:28. I hope you'll consider joining the ladies of WPDC for a weekend of fun, fellowship, and worship as you find true rest in our Savior. If you'd like more information and to register, just visit cmda.org slash WPDC. Oh, and one more thing before we close out this week's episode. CMDA Center for Wellbeing would like to invite you to join the upcoming 501 Foundations in Christian Coaching course that begins on October 25th. It runs each Tuesday evening through November 29th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Time each of those evenings. If you've been interested in learning more about coaching, join us for this six-week training course. Limited spots are still available and registration starts soon. So don't wait. Visit cmda.org slash wellbeing for more information. As I bring us to a close, that last announcement about well-being is so fitting because our topic next week for the interview is well-being. I'll be joined by two nurses who'd like to share with all of us about a program that they have developed to help our colleagues in nursing avoid burnout, a burnout that's become prominent, especially because of the COVID pandemic. Make sure to listen in next week and learn more. In closing, I hope you'll allow me to share this short quote from Dr. Agnetta when she was interviewed for the Forbes article. She said, quote, I have witnessed firsthand lives changed. To see the joy of a mother take her baby home, knowing that they will not only survive, but thrive. To see a patient who is literally at death's door from heart failure, recover after heart surgery and go on to be a star student, a committed teacher, carry a pregnancy safely to term and hold their baby in their arms, work in their farms, shape their community. To watch them live and live life fully is such a blessing. What a blessing it is to see the incredible impact surgeons like Dr. Agneta, Dr. Arega, and Dr. White are having on the entire continent of Africa today as they use their God-given skills to bring the hope and healing of Christ to our world. It's my prayer that you are doing the same as you impact your campus, your community, and your practice for Christ. And as you too bring the hope and healing of Christ to your world. That's what matters to CMDA and CMDA Matters. Thanks for listening today, and we'll see you next week, God willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. 
The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.